Welcome to part B of lecture nine of financial statement analysis. In this section, we're going to be looking at the residual income model, which is also called the discounted abnormal earnings model. I'm going to use those two names interchangeably. So in FSA, we're going to learn five different valuation methodologies. And this is the third valuation methodology, the discounted abnormal earnings, or the residual income model. Two names for the same model. In the prior model, when we looked at the dividend discount model, we valued a company based only on their forecast dividends. Now, in prior weeks of this subject, we've done an accounting analysis, we've reformatted the financial statements, and from our study of accounting, we know that financial statements contain a lot of really important information about a firm. So when we use the dividend discount model, we didn't actually take into account any of that prior work we've done or any of the accounting knowledge we have about the firm. So the discounted abnormal earnings model or the residual income model actually takes advantage of our accounting information. It utilizes the balance sheet and it utilizes the profit and loss statement. And we know the profit and loss statement is very important. We know that the firm's profit is the number one measure of their performance that gets utilized and analysts who follow companies do actually make forecasts of firms earnings per share or their profits. So for example, Apple here, they have 38 analysts covering them in June 2017, and they had estimates of their earnings per share. So lots and lots of professionals who are following this company and trying to predict their earnings. So using the residual income model, we can actually use these earnings predictions to help try and value the company. It's important to realize that the residual income model is actually derived from the dividend discount model. And that's because in accounting, when we have this clean surplus accounting relation, the clean surplus accounting relationship is what the comprehensive income is taking into account. When we looked at the comprehensive income statement previously, that was taking into account that sometimes in accounting, there are items or accounts that affect the equity of the business that are not recorded directly as revenues or expenses in the profit and loss statement. So the clean surplus accounting relationship is when we use this comprehensive income, we have these other items that affect a firm's equity balances, but they're not showing up in the net profit figure. Clean surplus accounting is important for this formula to actually work out. And all it is saying is that the equity this year is equal to equity last year, plus our net income, that is the comprehensive income in this case, minus the dividends that the firm pays out. We can rearrange the formula to make the dividends here on the left hand side, and the dividends are equal to the net income or the comprehensive income, plus equity last year minus equity this year. So if we substitute this relationship here into the dividend discount model and do some rearranging of the formula, what we're actually going to get is the residual income model. The textbook has the proof. I don't require you in this subject to know the proof, but if you're interested in it, you can have a look at how they've done the substitution and how mathematically it all works out. We end up getting a formula that says the equity value of a company is equal to their book value of equity. So now we're using the balance sheet and we're getting information from the balance sheet, the book value of equity, plus the present value of expected future abnormal earnings. And we'll talk about what abnormal earnings are soon. Abnormal earnings are also called residual income, and it represents if you're earning a return higher than your cost of capital. In prior lectures, I've mentioned this sentence, businesses create value when they earn a return higher than their cost of capital. Now, abnormal earnings or residual income is the name that we give to it when a firm is earning a return higher than their cost of capital. So if I start with a really simple example, I go to a bank and I borrow money for 4% and I decide to invest that money. And I find another bank account that is offering to pay me 4%. So I borrow from one bank at 4% and I invest that money into another bank account at 4%. Am I creating any value here? Well, I have to pay one bank 4% and the other bank pays me 4%. I end up equal at the end. My revenue from the 4% interest I earn gets eaten up in the 4% interest I have to pay as an expense. So I'm not actually creating any value from this transaction. 
If I borrow money from the bank at 4% interest, for me to actually create value, I need to invest that money and earn a return higher than 4%. I'd need to have a positive spread. So for a real business, it's the same concept. Whenever we have money that we've received from either investors, our equity, or from banks, debt capital, we have to invest that money and earn a return higher than that cost of capital. Abnormal earnings or residual income is the name when we have invested our money and earned a return higher than our cost of capital. So the residual income for a firm, RI, or you could put AE for abnormal earnings, is equal to the firm's net income, okay, or their comprehensive income, minus their cost of equity capital times the amount of equity they had invested, that is from the balance sheet last year. So what that's saying is, if I've got a million dollars of equity invested in my business, that's what's on the total equity in my balance sheet, and my investors demand a 10% return on the equity they've put in, they're only investing in my business because they think I'll generate at least a 10% return for them. So they've invested a million dollars equity and they expect a 10% return. So they would expect me to earn $100,000 of profit every year. If my net income was higher than 100,000 and I earned $150,000 profit, would say the net income of $150,000 minus 10% times the million, that generates a residual income or an abnormal earning of 50,000. I earned more than my cost of capital. I actually created excess value for the business or for the shareholders by generating a return higher than their cost of capital. We want to now take that into account, the residual income model. We're going to have a look at the formula here. We're going to say the value of a firm's equity is equal to their owner's equity, that is on the balance sheet at time zero, so their most recent balance sheet, the total equity, plus RI, the residual income in one year, divided by one plus RE. This is looking very similar to the dividend discount model, except instead of discounting dividends, we're discounting residual income for each year. Plus, at the start, we're adding the equity from the balance sheet. So we're taking into account our accounting knowledge. We're using the balance sheet as a starting point for valuing the firm. Then we're taking any abnormal earnings or residual income each year and discounting it back to get the present value. Then at the end, also a terminal value. Now in the prior slide, we said, what is the residual income? The residual income of a firm is equal to their net income minus their cost of capital times their equity balance. So here we've got the formula for the value of equity. I've put it in the red box because this is the formula that you're going to be applying when you actually use this model. The value of a firm's equity is equal to their equity at time zero, straight from the balance sheet, plus the net income, this is from our forecast template, minus our cost of equity capital times the balance sheet equity. Then in year two, it's net income in year two, minus the cost of equity times equity in year one. So this would be from our forecast template, divided through by one plus our cost of equity to the power of two. Okay, We keep adding it up each year that we forecast until we do a terminal value calculation and discount back the terminal value. The formula can also be expressed using ROE instead. It's mathematically the same. We can either use the net income number or we could use the return on equity and just rearrange some numbers a little bit. I'm, I'm going to use this formula. Some textbooks that you look at would use this formula, but they mean the exact same thing. So the residual income model is focusing on future residual income forecasts. No longer are we valuing the company based on, based on forecast dividends. We're valuing the company based on their current book value of equity and any forecast residual income. This is actually really beneficial for us because analysts actually do forecast the firm's earnings. And with the analysis we've done in pre previous weeks, we've looked at the accounting information very closely and tried to undo any accounting distortions. We know accrual accounting will generally balance out over time, it's self-correcting. So in this residual income valuation model, we've got some real key benefits in that we're utilizing the balance sheet value of the assets, we're utilizing the income statement or profit and loss statement forecasts of net profits, 
and then able to calculate residual income. Residual incomes will only come about when a company has a strong competitive advantage. And so when we do our terminal value assumptions, we also have to think about the industry and economic analysis that we've previously done to think about if our company has a competitive edge, if they have a moat around their business that'll allow them continuing to grow their residual income into the future. So again, here we've got our residual income model formula with the terminology here. I've tried to make it clear by saying VE is the value of equity. This owner's equity zero is meaning from the actual balance sheet, time zero is what information we've got now. Net income are all forecast into the future from our forecast templates. Owner's equity zero is from our actual balance sheet. Then in future years, we're using our owner's equity forecast from our forecast template. The cost of equity capital we're going to look at in lecture 10, so we'll learn how to calculate that next week. And the terminal value over here is calculated using one of the three methods that we're about to go through. The steps for applying the residual income model are very similar to the dividend discount model, except we've got an extra line here where we have to calculate the residual income based on our income and owner's equity forecast. And at the very end, this last step here, we also have to add in the owner's equity plus the discounted residual income plus the discounted terminal value. So there's two extra steps in this model compared to the dividend discount model. My advice to you is most of you will make this mistake at least once. You will forget to add the owner's equity when you do it. Okay, so just be for your assignment, really be double checking and especially in the exam. When you do this model, remember you do add the owner's equity plus the discounted residual income plus the discounted terminal value. The residual income model offers us three different terminal value assumptions. It's very similar to the three terminal value assumptions in the dividend discount model. Case one is that terminal value equals zero. Now this is interpreted differently to the dividend discount model, even though mathematically it looks the same. A residual income of zero doesn't necessarily mean the business has gone bankrupt or closed down. It means we are no longer earning a return higher than our cost of capital. So a residual income of zero may occur in a highly competitive business. If we're in a really competitive industry where we'd say in economics terms, perfect competition, companies will only generate a return equal to their cost of capital, which would mean there is no abnormal earnings or no residual income in future years. So terminal value of zero under the residual income model doesn't mean the company's gone bankrupt or failed. It means no abnormal earnings. Maybe it's in perfect competition. The second case for the residual income model terminal value, case two, is when we maintain a constant residual income into the future. So that would occur when we believe our company has some sort of competitive advantage. They're going to maintain abnormal earnings or residual income in the future, but they're not going to be able to grow that residual income. So the formula for terminal value under case two is whatever our ending residual income forecast is, we divide through by our cost of equity capital to get the perpetuity. Case three represents growth in our residual income model. So we've got the residual income model and it's grown, so we've said residual income at t plus one. Our final residual income forecast times by one plus the growth rate would give you the residual income in the following year. You then divide through by the cost of equity capital minus the growth rate to get a perpetuity with growth. The cost of capital must be larger than the growth rate. If you expect your company is gonna grow their residual income every year by 10%, then their cost of capital must be more than 10%. To expect 10% growth in residual income, you'd have to be taking on a lot of risk in your business. And so would expect the residual, would expect the cost of capital has to be higher than the growth rate. And if it's not, you'd end up getting negatives and your valuation wouldn't work as well. As I mentioned, case one for the residual income model is when the residual income is zero. If you think about a business like a cafe, they can be profitable, 
but we wouldn't expect due to such high levels of competition, we wouldn't expect their residual income to be very high for a long time into the future. We definitely wouldn't expect it to grow because the industry competition is so tight that small little cafes like this are operating much more in a situation similar to perfect competition. They can make a profit, but their profit is likely to be close to their cost of capital. Some industries have government inter intervention, uh, things like airports often and ports, utility pricing. Governments will try and prevent these monopoly providers from being able to change their prices too much. So in those situations, they might not have residual income if the government's really, really strict. However, most of the time, the government will allow a little bit of residual income uh, because their, their policies won't be that strict. When you look at the residual income model on an Excel spreadsheet like this, if we've got a terminal value of zero, as we step through it, we forecast the net income, we forecast the owner's equity, we calculate the discount factors, and we calculate residual income each year. Then we assume zero for all the future years. So the value of the firm is equal to the residual income for these three years that gets discounted back. We add them up and then we also add the owner's equity from the first year to get the total value of equity. Here down here, we've got the formula as if we saw it like this. Value of equity is equal to the owner's equity plus the residual income that is discounted for each year gets added up. So we can put it in Excel and do it line by line, or we could write it as a formula like this and still get the same answer. The second case of residual income was when we do earn a residual income or we do earn an abnormal earning. We expect it to be maintained for a long time in the future, but we don't necessarily expect it's going to grow. So you have a sustainable competitive advantage. Could also be due to accounting conservatism if you think about things like the pharmaceutical industry where certain things must be expensed rather than called an asset you would expect your profits to maybe be higher than expected from your book value because your book value is artificially low due to conservatism when we apply the residual income model like we've got our spreadsheet here in this case Calculate residual income. We've got our residual income for each year, like the previous example. But then we've also, in the following year, got the same residual income, this 3,005. We use that to calculate the terminal value here, divide through by the cost of capital to get the perpetuity. Then we discount the terminal value. Add up all the discounted residual incomes plus the discounted terminal value to get, plus the equity to get the total equity value. We could express it as a formula like this to also get the same answer. The final case is residual incomes that grow forever into the future. This is going to be rare because it implies that your business has a competitive advantage and they'll be able to maintain growing that competitive advantage in the future. So this is going to apply for rare companies that have a really strong business, very unique. You could think of things like Amazon and Apple and McDonald's, those kind of businesses that have done a really great job of maintaining their competitive advantage and growing it into the future. So the final example here, when we have our residual income for each year, in this forecast year, I am taking the final year's residual income and I'm multiplying it by one plus 12% to get my new final year uh, residual income. And I divide that through by R minus G 12% sorry, 14% cost of capital minus the 12% growth rate. So I get a perpetuity with growth. I then have to remember to discount it back. So I get the discounted terminal value. I add up all my discounted residual incomes plus my discounted terminal value plus my owner's equity to get the total value of equity. The residual income model has a lot of advantages. That's why we're learning it in addition to the dividend discount model. There's some academic research, and I'll show you a few papers in conclusion at the end of this lecture, that do show that this method actually outperforms other valuation methods. Now, even though they are, even though the residual income model is derived from the dividend discount model, so they are equivalent valuation methods, the way people actually apply these valuation methods 
usually results in some mistakes in the application. And the residual income model is therefore more accurate than the dividend discount model, because as these mistakes are sort of taken into account the practicalities of implementing the models, the residual income model is usually more accurate. That's because it focuses on both the value drivers of the company and the financial statements. It incorporates the book value or the owner's equity that's on the balance sheet. It allows us to utilize our income statement forecast, which should hopefully be reasonably accurate after we've done our industry and economic analysis, our strategy analysis, and our accounting analysis. After reformatting the financial statements, it allows us to focus on value drivers. So what actually causes our business to be profitable and what we're investing in rather than just financing decisions such as what dividend should we pay. The fact that it's using accrual accounting is beneficial. That means we're using our profit and loss and balance sheet. Accrual accounting is this whole complicated process. The reason we do it is it allows us to make better forecasts about our future performance. Obviously, the disadvantage of this model is to implement it, we had to go through this whole process of doing an accounting analysis and making sure we trust the accounting statements. So accounting complexity can mean that earnings can be a little bit obscure or the book value of assets might also be a little bit obscure. So because this model requires accounting information and accounting information can be complicated, that can be a potential disadvantage of the model. The forecast horizon, this is a problem for all valuation models. The forecast horizon, it's hard to forecast lots of years into the future. That's why price multiples are very simple because we don't have to do forecasting. The forecast horizon depends on the quality of accounting and if it's going to be volatile or smooth accounting earnings. So that can be a little bit of a disadvantage, but that applies to all our formal valuation models. Now I'm going to show you how to apply the residual income model using the Gale Pacific spreadsheet and do a demonstration of that. I've opened up the Gale Pacific spreadsheet and I've got a template for the residual income model. And I'm going to use a terminal value with growth in this particular case. Okay, so I'm going to first of all say I need to forecast my comprehensive income. And I know that I've already done comprehensive income forecasts on my forecast template. So I'm going to go to the forecast template here, my comprehensive income for 2020. And I'm going to drag that along for the following years. I need to forecast my owner's equity. I've already got my 2019 actual equity from the balance sheet. And I'm going to go to my forecasting template and get my owner's equity forecast from down here. I'm dragging that along. So now I have my comprehensive income for 2020 to 2024 forecasts and my owner's equity as well for those years. So now I need to calculate the residual income. So I need to apply that residual income formula. So if I look back at my slides and I go back to the formula, the residual income, net income this year, minus my cost of capital times owner's equity of the previous year. So let's apply that formula. This is calculating the abnormal earnings. Was my earnings higher than I expected it to be. So equals this year's earnings minus my cost of capital, 7.6% times last year's equity. Sorry. So my income minus my owner's equity times the cost of capital gives me my residual income. And I'm going to drag that along for each of the years. So now I have residual income forecast for each of the years. So let's have a look at this formula. I've made a mistake. I didn't lock the cell for my cost of capital. So I need to put the dollar signs in. Now when I drag it along, I've got this year's income minus last year's owner's equity times my cost of capital. Okay, 
So based on the forecast I've got here, I've actually forecast that Gale Pacific will be making negative residual income for each of these years. That means I, based on these forecasts that we've put together, we believe that this company would actually be destroying value each year. They're not earning a return equal to their cost of capital. So that's a pretty negative forecast to have. We'd have to go back to our forecasting template and have a look at the company to actually think if that's a realistic assumption or not. Okay. So we've now got our residual income. Next step, calculate the discount factors equals one plus my cost of capital. And I'm gonna I'll lock in that cost of capital cell, do the absolute referencing to the power of the years I need to discount it back. So I drag that across. Okay, so I've got my discount factors. I can now calculate the present value of my residual incomes. The residual income for the year divided by the discount factor for that year and drag it across to get my present values. I'm going to calculate the terminal value for Gale Pacific and I'm going to use a 2% growth in their terminal value. So over here, I've got the prior year's residual income and I'm going to assume that's going to grow by 2% forever. So I'm going to say last year's residual income multiplied by one plus my growth rate. And so that actually makes the, because it's a negative residual income here, it actually makes the residual income that I'm forecasting here get more negative each year. And I don't actually want that. I want it to go towards zero. So I'm going to put a minus here. So I'm actually going to grow by minus 2% growth here. So it starts moving closer towards zero each year. Okay, so I did say that residual income with growth is the rarer sort of expectation in evaluation model. Here I'm doing it because I don't think they're going to make negative residual incomes forever. And I think it's going to start moving towards zero. So that's why I've put a negative 2% growth rate here to make their overall residual income move closer to zero. So then I have to calculate the terminal value based on this residual income. The residual income with growth divided through by my cost of equity capital minus the growth rate. So I now get a perpetuity with growth that takes into account cost of equity capital 7.6% and the growth is 2%. That calculation is done in year five. So I need to divide through by my year five discount factor to get the present value of the terminal value. So my total equity value now is equal to my forecast owner's equity for 2019. So my actual owner's equity plus the sum of all my discounted residual incomes plus the present value of my terminal value. So I add them all up and I get a total equity value here. I've got the number of shares outstanding from Gale Pacific's financial statements and I calculate through to get a price per share of 24.3 cents. And that would be a buy because the current share price is 15 cents. As I've said before, this is not investment advice. This is just for educational purposes. The assumptions I've used here may not be realistic. They're just as an illustration. To actually get a, a more realistic value, if this is okay, you'd really wanna do a very good job of understanding this owner's equity balance. Make sure there's no items that need to be written off or anything like that and do a better job with the forecasting. So that's it for the residual income model. It's a powerful valuation model in that it utilizes the company's balance sheet information, like their owner's equity. We use our forecast earnings numbers, and then we look at the economics of the business to see if we expect them to actually earn a return higher than their cost of capital expects they will. So we calculate the residual income. Thank you.